morning. How's everybody doing? Having a few technical difficulties, if you'll just give us a second. Then we'll be right with you. Just relax. If it takes too long, just go get another cup of coffee. Everybody have a good week? Well, good. Did you get that extra shower in on your way in? Took a shower, got all ready, went outside. I was like, dang it, I didn't even need to do that. Could have saved a few minutes. It's not like you guys are going to smell me or anything. That'd be weird. <laughs> Morning. All right. I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we'll jump into some worship. I'm um, really excited about this set. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's good to see you all here. I want to encourage you guys in worship this morning uh, just to feel comfortable in, in worship and in, in word. Um, we are blessed to be in a, in a place where we can do what we do here. And so I just want to encourage you this morning to um, just find what you feel like God is speaking in your life and, and just try to listen closely. Father, we thank you so much just for who you are and how you speak in our lives. And Father, I just pray that you just um, ready our hearts for what you have in store this morning. Father, encourage us this morning. Um, make us bold for you. Allow us to just hear you in your word and in your worship, Father. We love you and thank you. Amen. <clears throat> You come. 
sin was heavy, chains breaking the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, and now you call me the citizen of heaven. You said with broken, you were my
Friends, please be seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team. That was spiritual and soulful, too, so thank you. Friends, my name is Tom. I'm one of the pastors here in the life of Long's Chaplain. It's good to be with you here today. Uh, you know, throughout our lives, we all need something that we can hold on to, something firm. Uh, and, you know, as Christians, we can always know that Jesus is on the throne. Uh, and friends, in this place... If you feel led to contribute to the building of the kingdom of God, making the world a better place, there are ways to do that here as well. And so I hope you hold on to that bulletin, uh, as there are a lot of ways to plug in, whether you're interested in joining a discipleship group, uh, partnering with one of our community missions uh, to help reach out to those in our community. Um, if you'd like to give, you can scan the QR code on the back. It makes it really easy to give your tithes and offerings. Um, and as always, friends, there's wonderful Christian fellowship and hospitality here. Uh, in, in the spirit of celebration, uh, anybody born in September that's here today? We have any September babies? There we go. All right. Woohoo, Stephen! We, we won't sing happy birthday because the worship team's gone and I'm not going to do it. But. <laughs> But Stephen, I saw you uh, get a cupcake on your way in. I'm sure, I'm sure you can get one on your way out too if you'd like. And anyone else who'd like to be celebrated, uh, we have cupcakes in the gathering area to celebrate our September babies because we were glad that you were born. 
Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He'll just burn it right off. There, I'm, I, I think there's a Cupcake 5K coming up. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> friends, as we pray for the word, will you join me in prayer? Oh, God, we thank you for laughter, and we thank you for healing. God, as we reflect upon the miracle of healing, we can look back upon our lives and realize that it's something that's been there all along, from the healing of cuts and scrapes to, God, your gift of sanctification, and through your grace, the way that our souls are continually healed. God, we pray for healing for our earth, which is wounded, and we trust in the miracle of healing. Uh, And God, each and every one of us, uh, we have tender hearts, and we know that your grace can heal all. Uh, And so God, as we prepare to hear the word, we ask that the Holy Spirit be with us, ministering to our hearts, both individually and collectively, as we reflect upon your healing grace, which is already poured out for us. We have but to open our hearts and our arms to receive it. We thank you, God, for that gift. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, man. Oh, man. Thanks, Pastor Tom. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. morning. You're doing well, I hope and pray. Grateful for your presence. Grateful for a chance to share together in worship. Uh, My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors also in the life of Long's Chapel. And, man, we're so grateful to see you. There's a Connect card attached to your bulletin. Um, If you'd like to fill that out, we'd love for you to fill that out. If there's uh, ways that we can provide you more information or set up a time to meet or have a conversation with you, we'd love to be about that. Um, You can actually um, kind of there's a tearaway part of your bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin, it's okay. I know there are plenty in the gathering space. Um, And there's some white boxes out there by the entrance and exit doors that you can actually place those. uh, Just know that we'd love to be in ministry with you. Um, Can I just affirm with you for just a minute? Because I know that there's just a lot of conversation um, man, just a whole lot of conversation. I know that we had a, um, a vote last uh, Sunday, and um, I woke up with a scripture on my heart, which is kind of the heart of like um, some teaching that um, God gives to us through uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, where he um, talks about the fact that we have the opportunity to um, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Um, just like literally those words woke me up this morning, is that that's a privilege and the opportunity and the space that, that we actually have um, to lean into with one another. And um, that is holy, and that is healing space. And so I just want to um, just allow us to all pay attention to that um, as we're kind of aware of the fact that God is longing to do a bit of a new thing in us. And that was going to happen no matter what the vote said. Today was going to be the beginning of a bit of a new season in the life of Long's Chapel. And what has been um, like just a super lengthy, even unnecessary, um, uh, extra lengthy uh, discernment process um, uh, affords us the opportunity to be able to, to yoke our hearts in a bit of a new way as a community of faith um, today. And I just want to affirm that. I, wanna, I want us to lean into that. Can I just, uh, just share a, a summary of like these Roman 12 words? They're not, um, they're not actually the text for the sermon, but they just feel really important. Uh, love must be sincere. So hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. Isn't that like a cool phrase? Never be lacking in zeal. Michelle Hauser, you are never lacking in zeal. Can I just use you as an example? Um, But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Like rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people in a different position. Don't be conceited. Don't repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Um, if, um, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace. With everyone, don't take revenge. And then Paul actually goes back a little bit to the Old Testament saying, like, don't take revenge. Don't do that. Actually, uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. Um, If he or she is thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, um, you will have the opportunity to overcome evil with good. Uh, Can I just affirm and um, invite all of us into uh, a chance to reclaim the gift. I think the life of Long's Chapel, especially over the last 
uh, eight or nine months, and con confessionally, I actually think, like, I'll confess on behalf of all of us, it's not been the best season in the life of this church. It's actually been really difficult. It's actually been really challenging. It's forced us to live in the extremes of, of um, faith, all kinds of extremes, and that's just not the space that I think we um, thrive well in. Uh, and we have an opportunity to be able to change that today. Like, we have an opportunity to change that today. I want to invite you to join with me to change that today. Um, that, like, um, any us and them stuff that we've had, it's, it's, it's no more. It's, it's done. It's, it's all us's. Um, and it's not because anybody that you might have ever considered them is not with us anymore. It's because we were always all us's. We're all all us's. So when you think about Jesus' ministry and how Jesus chose to, like, whoever you might label as a them, Jesus, like, pulled them in and invited us to think about the fact that we're all created in the image of God. Um, we're all equal in the eyes of the Lord and that we have the opportunity and the privilege um, to realize that not only do we bear the image of God inside of us, but every person bears the image of God inside of them. And if, if everyone isn't welcome um, in Christ church, then none of us are welcome in Christ church. Amen to that? Like, all people matter to God. Like, that's not just a tag phrase on the line of our mission statement. Our mission statement, all of the rest of it doesn't even make sense if all people don't matter to God. All people matter to God. We may disagree about what that means and, like, what that looks like, but last week we had an opportunity to, at least as a congregation, um, uh, weigh into the fact that it um, will lean into this new day. Uh, we'll lean into this new day together, and I just want to invite you to join um, in that as we... Um, uh, as we have an opportunity to, to partner with one another in ministry, and most importantly, uh, to partner with the Holy Spirit that is longing to do a profound and powerful work in and through us. Um, as we have a chance to reflect a little bit, today we continue our um, sermon series where we've been kind of praying about what does healing look like. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, and today we have a really interesting um, way to kind of look at healing uh, I didn't actually cue this up as the salt team to cue this up, but I'm thinking about the Beatles song, and I get by with a little help from my friends. You guys remember that song? So um, I'm not asking if you're old and you remember that song. I'm saying, have you heard it, right? Like, have you heard that song? I get by with a little help from my friends. And so spiritual friendship matters. Spiritual friendship is like at the core of, of what church has always been meant to be. It's why before, um, we, before like what we know as church was actually called church, it was very much called kind of a community or a fellowship of believers. Like, it's like spiritual friendship is at the core of it all. And today we get to hear a, an amazing story out of the Gospels. It's actually told in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. I'm just going to read the Luke version. Uh, but we have a chance to um, enter into that story and find our place in it. So can I invite you to do that? Because I think there's a lot of places where we could find ourselves in this particular story. Um, and so I just, uh, like, I want to invite you to do that. So, um, again, Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. So, one day as he was teaching, Pharisees and religious leaders were sitting around. For they had come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea. That's the region and area where Jesus was from. Even as far away as Jerusalem, which was like, you know, the big holy city, like way down the road. But they'd come from everywhere, these religious leaders and Pharisees. they come from everywhere. Uh, the healing power of God was on him. The healing power of God was on him. Can you say those words to me? The healing power of God was on him. Can we do it one more time? The healing power of God was on him. And some men arrived carrying a paraplegic on a stretcher. And so they were looking for a way to get into the house and to set him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, um, that didn't deter them. They went up on the roof. They went up on the roof and they removed some of the roof, the tiles and such, and they let him down in the middle of everyone right in front of Jesus. And impressed by their bold belief, he said, friend, I forgive your sins. That set the religious scholars and the Pharisees buzzing. They were like, like, who does he think he is? That's blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. Well, Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. And he said, um, why all this gossipy whispering in here? Isn't that like a great phrase, gossipy whispering? I love that. 
Um, you teachers might want to use that this week. Why all this gossipy whispering in here? Um, <laughs> which, which is simpler, to say, I forgive your sins? Or to say, get up and start walking? Well, just so it's clear that I'm the son of man and authorized to do either or both, he now spoke directly to the paraplegic and he said, get up and take your bedroll and go home. And without a moment's hesitation, he did it. He got up and he took his blanket and he left for home, giving glory to God all the way. And the people, they rubbed their eyes. They were stunned. Uh, and then, like, also gave glory to God, all struck. And they said, like, we've never seen anything like that. So this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, man, what a, like a powerful, powerful story. The imagery in this story is almost on overload. So can I invite you to, to kind of enter into the story and kind of find your space in it? Uh, again, this particular story uh, is a place where Jesus seems to be confronting uh, folks like Pharisees and religious leaders and teachers that don't really understand him and can't really get a beat on him, and they don't actually have control over him. So they're actually really frustrated, um, super frustrated with him. So my hunch is that they are there in this house taking like copious notes so that they can find something to take back to the powers that be so that they can actually find a way to, quote, unquote, get rid of Jesus. Uh, they're, in other words, probably not there to hear his teaching, right? They're there to kind of criticize everything about this healing and restorative ministry that, that Jesus is actually about. And so we find ourselves uh, in the very beginning part of this story, seeing Jesus, and he's kind of surrounded by some folks. I think we actually have a picture of what a first century house might have looked like. This is an example of a first century house. Thank you, Michael. Um, this is an example of a first century house. This would have actually been a pretty, like a wealthier person's house. Um, this would have been like a pretty nice house in first century, especially in Capernaum and in the Galilee area. Like you see that you have a couple of stories here. Again, it's not like all of this, all of this is smaller than uh, a double wide trailer. Okay, so just proportionate. For, all of this is smaller than that. But, but as you look at that, you get a sense of the fact that there's a bit of an upstairs, which is a living area. There's a bit of a downstairs, which is kind of where the kitchen and the animals hang out. You have this, like, opportunity to appreciate the fact that you see there on the side the description, which is the, you have, like, mud brick walls covered with clay and straw. That's actually something of what's on top of the roof as well. If you were pretty impoverished, um, or if you were even kind of like what we would consider today is um, just kind of like middle class folk, you would probably have something like a grass roof. Um, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be straw. It could be straw, but it would probably be a little bit more of a grass roof, kind of a thatchy roof. Uh, you'd also have some mud up there. You'd also have the mud that would probably have some brick pieces in it for a little bit of strength. Um, and that would be meant to obviously repel a bit of the elements, um, and it would need repair. You think roof repair today is tough. Don't you think about the first century? Like, these are not huge roofs you're repairing, but kind of a big deal. But I want to invite you to think about this. And so there is a man who, who cannot walk on his own. Okay? The message, the message version of the scripture says that he's paraplegic. Uh, that particular word in Greek, it, it means he, he's like disabled. He's paralyzed. So you think about that because as we enter into the story, there are a lot of ways to be paralyzed, aren't there? We can be paralyzed by fear. We can be paralyzed by just anxiety and struggle. We can be paralyzed by a situation or circumstance that we encounter that we don't know what to do with. You know that whole trauma response thing of, like freeze, fawn, or fight, like that's a real thing, and freeze is really a thing, and there's a lot of different ways that somebody could be um, paralyzed, or that somebody could be not able to walk or move on their own. In this particular context, because it's a physical ailment, in addition to potentially some other things that are going on, uh, this particular person would have been blamed for their own condition. They would have been, like it would have been common Jewish teaching in this day, uh, that somehow if some kind of physical affliction had happened with a person like um, this, this paraplegic, then somehow either they or somebody that they loved who their, dis, their displeasure with God had rubbed off on them um, had really made God mad, and that's why this, this was happening. 
Now, Jesus comes and wants to spend his whole ministry upending this lie. But, but that is actually common teaching um, uh, in the day. And so it kind of takes that whole reap what you sow kind of stuff. It just takes that and puts it on steroids. And all these religious leaders and all these Pharisees are very much kind of bought into that way of thinking. And so in other words, if this guy is a paraplegic, not only does he, um, not only does he take some responsibility in his, in his kind of own affliction, but, but there is full responsibility there for the ways that he may or may not have been obedient to God. And so here's what we have. We have um, somebody who can't walk on their own. And then we have what we believe are, just piecing together the three different versions of the story that we have. I want you to think about uh, a stretcher. I want you to think about the material. I want you to think about two, this is first century stuff, right? I want you to think about like, uh, let, let me turn it up, right? So we got like, like I don't know, two, two pretty, pretty hefty, cool pieces of wood. You've got some fabric that are woven in between to make it a bit of a strong bed. And you've got four friends who, for one reason or another, are not okay with the fact that, that this person is having to deal with the condition that they're dealing with. Like, like they just can't accept it as okay. And they want to do something about it. Now, I need you to think with me for a minute about the difference. Sometimes, friends, we uh, can observe healing, and it's a pretty remarkable thing when we observe healing. I mean, it's pretty inspiring. I mean, last night at you know, 9.30 or 10 o'clock, I'm able to hold the, man, hold the hand of a man and pray who will probably pass away today. And that's a form of healing, by the way. Um, there's a form of victory in that. I uh, met with him two weeks ago, and we sang, Victory in Jesus and I'll fly away, because he's ready then and he's ready now. Um, and he's lived a, you know, a good life and, and all of that, and he's said the things he needs to say, and, and he's ready to go on and be with Jesus. And so I had an opportunity to hold his hand and to witness, to witness this, um, this healing. It's, it's sad, and it's challenging, and it's painful, and it's also beautiful and remarkable and, and supernatural. I mean, it's just all of that, right? So you think about that. But I want you to think about the difference. The, these, these, I'm going to call them dudes. These four dudes that are carrying this guy, they're, they don't want to just observe healing. They're going to participate in it. They're going to participate in it. So they're going to put this guy on a stretcher, and they're going to carry him. Now, I know enough for my daughter, and um, my daughter got her like EMS training kind of stuff because she wants to be a physician's assistant, and she has to get all kinds of hours and stuff. So she decided she wanted to do that through some you know, ambulance kind of stuff. So she got trained not this past summer, but not, not this summer, but last summer. And man, I mean, she would tell me stories about the ways that when somebody is sick and not able to participate in lifting themselves, it takes several people to be able to lift somebody who can't lift themselves and, you know, kind of get them on a stretcher or something of that nature. So this is like not a super simple task that's happening. And yet it seems as if these four dudes will not be deterred by any obstacle to healing that is presented before them. They are determined. They're determined. They're so determined that when they get to the house and they can't, can I see that picture of that um, house again, if you don't mind, guys? Um, like when, when, when they can't come here, Right, because let's just assume that let's just assume that Jesus is teaching in here, and let's assume there's people up there, and let's assume there's people all around him. Let's make that assumption, right? In our imagination, we can imagine that. So they get to the front door. There's no way. There's nowhere for them to go. There's nowhere for them to go. So what do they do? Well, here's what they do. They decide they're going to throw a ladder up on the side, right? So that ladder that you see inside, they're going to somehow throw that on the outside of the house, except it's going to be taller. And they're going to carry the guy on the stretcher all the way up the ladder. I have no clue how in the world that happens. But that's what they do. Or they're going to pulley him or something, right? Like, I mean, you, get, you get that image. And then Luke is telling the story. And Luke is a bit of a physician. And so Luke is really actually from a different social class than a majority of the disciples. So Luke's going to actually tell the story a little different than the other, um, than the other um, two accounts that we have. But neither here nor there, Luke's a great storyteller. That's why I picked his version of the story. So in Luke's version, um, they're going to start to peel back tile. Tile is like what you would primarily have on top of your house uh, as the top layer of the roof if you were pretty 
affluent uh, in that particular region. And so in Luke's version of the story, and it may very well have been an affluent person's house because it had to be big enough to actually hold a more than normal amount of people. And so sure enough, there are going to be tiles that are going to be pulled off the roof. And then here's what these guys are going to do. Not, like as if carrying this guy to the house wasn't important enough. As if like finding a ladder and pulling him up to the top wasn't enough. They're going to start peeling back the tile, and they're going to start, like, like removing the mud and the grass and the straw and stuff that's there. They're literally going to get their hands dirty to participate in the potential healing of their friend. When's the last time you got your hands dirty for a friend? When's the last time that you got your hands dirty, that you went out of your way to help participate in the potential healing for a friend. These guys couldn't heal this guy, but these guys were doing everything they could to take him to the one person who could. They lower him in um, to, the, to the house and they lay him at Jesus' feet. You hear all the obstacles, right? There are not enough obstacles to be placed in their way for them not to participate and this guy's healing in, in, on this particular day in, in this particular way. Jesus is so impressed with that. I'm impressed with that. I've spent half the sermon talking about it. Jesus is impressed with that. And Jesus is impressed with the way the Gospels tell it, their bold faith, their dirty hands, their tired muscles, their hurting backs. He's impressed with all of it. And so, like, what happens? Well, he looks, he looks, actually, actually, Luke is very specific in the way that he tells the story. And I don't want to overplay this, but, but what Jesus seems to do in that moment is he um, forgives sins. We, we think he's talking to the guy on the stretcher. He also could have been talking to the folks in the room that were the religious leaders. He also could have been talking about the guys on the roof that helped lower him in. We, we don't actually totally know, but... But, but we do know that folks would have associated personal sin of this particular guy with his affliction. And we know that Jesus' first interaction with him and with everybody in that room, with him in there, is to be able to say, um, your sins are forgiven. I want you to think about with me before anything else happens in this story. Forgiveness is the foundation of the miracle. Forgiveness is the foundation of the miracle. Now, like, like what happens is that gossipy whispering stuff, right? I mean, I'm plowing through the story pretty quickly, but you guys can go look at it in more detail later if you want, and I hope and pray that you will. But there's this gossipy whisper that starts. And basically, it's not about the fact that healing may have just started coming to the room. It's about the question of the fact of, is Jesus actually authorized to even do that? Now, that's a really important detail, friends. It's a super important detail. Because, like, they're literally looking at the front edge of an incredible miracle that's happening in this room in this moment. And they're not, they're not focused on the miracle. They're worried about, is it even possible for the guy that's saying the words to be a part of the miracle? That's where their focus is. They're majoring in the minors. And so, like, Jesus calls them out and says, like, what's all this gossipy whispering stuff? Like, what are you guys doing? Oh, like, you don't think that I have the authority to say what I just said? Well, what's harder, to say that your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, roll up your mat, and go home? You know what? Paraphrasing Jesus, I actually have the authority to say both. I've already said, your sins are forgiven. Now I say, take up your mat, walk, and go home. I, I, I didn't explore it at 9 o'clock, and it's not actually technically part of my outline today, but I want to do some more research this week on that take up your mat part. Um, it's almost like Jesus is saying in the healed state that you're getting ready to have, you don't need that equipment anymore. Like it served a purpose for you, but you don't, 
You don't need that where you're going. You don't need that where you're going. How this particular story ends is um, pretty remarkable because uh, how it ends is this uh, amazing affirmation um, that there is astonishment in the room. Let me go back to the scripture itself. Here's what they say, right? Like, took up his blanket, he left for home, giving glory to God all the way, did this particular gentleman who was paralyzed, but now the par- he's been released from the paralysis. Right? He's been released from the paralysis. And people rub their eyes, stunned, and they also gave glory to God, awestruck, that they said, we've never seen anything like that before. Can you hear the, I want to be kind to them here, the, 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 the skepticism, but also the curiosity in that? It, it's almost like if somebody had their mind made up going into that room, how they were going to feel about Jesus when they came out, that they're kind of feeling a little bit different based on what they saw. But they're also, like, they're curious about what's different about what had just happened. Like, they're not giving themselves over to it. But they're curious about what had just happened. Because what had just happened was a two-part miracle where the grounds of God's forgiving, merciful, remarkable, unconditional love was laid for all. And on top of that foundation... Someone who was stuck and frozen in their body, wherever they were when they got that way, they were able to now move. They were able to now move. And, and, and folks are walking away a bit astonished as he walks away glorifying God for not what he saw, but for now what he knows. I just kind of close the sermon with two things. I ran to this quote this week. I just, it's really been speaking to my soul. It's actually um, unknown. I don't know where it comes from, and I couldn't find a reference for it, but it says, you are built to handle the pressure that comes with your calling. You are built to handle the pressure that comes with your calling. It kind of sounds like a GMC commercial, doesn't it, or a car commercial, but you're built to handle the pressure that comes with the course. No, that comes with your calling because God would never call you into something. God would never call you into something that God hadn't already put inside of you what is needed for you to be prepared to be able to deal with anything that would come up, any obstacle that you might face, right, uh, about doing the work that God has, has called us to do. Can, can I close with this story? It's a story that I remember as a kid. My dad used to tell as a part of sermons, and it's a story that's kind of woven into my spirit and soul. There's a lot of different versions of it, but it just, I don't know, it just feels like, I don't think I've ever used it in a sermon here, I don't think. Uh, it's just, it feels like today is a day to be able to do that, and it's a story that goes something like this. On a dangerous seacoast where shipyards, where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a little life-saving station. And the building was primitive, and yet there was one boat, but the members of the life-saving station were committed, and, well, they kept a constant watch over the sea. And when a ship went down, they unselfishly went out day or night to save those who were lost at sea, because so many lives were saved by that station. The station itself became famous. It It became known as a place that rescued people. Consequently, many people wanted to be associated with the station, and they wanted to give their time and their talents and their money to support its important work. And so there's a lot that came along with that. There were new boats that were bought. There were new crews that were recruited. A formal training session was offered. As the membership in the life-saving station grew, some of the members actually became unhappy that the building was so primitive and that the equipment was so outdated. And so they wanted to, well, they wanted to better the place, right? Right? They wanted to better the place, most specifically for survivors that would come in, that the folks that were doing that work would have better equipment to work with. And so they replaced the emergency cots with beds, and they put better furniture in the enlarged and newly decorated building. And now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they met regularly, and when they did, it was apparent how they loved each other. They greeted each other, hugged one another, they shared life events that were going on, but fewer members were now interested in going out to sea on life-saving missions. 
So you know what they did? They hired a staff to do that work, right? So they hired lifeboat crews to go out and do that saving work for them. So about this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast. And the hired crews, they brought in life-saving boats of, like, cold and wet and dirty and sick and half-drowned people. And, like, they were of all different colors and sizes, and some of them were bruised and battered, and it was just a really messy situation. Some of them didn't speak English very well. It was really challenging. Some of them were first-class passengers in the ship. Others were deckhands. But somehow this beautiful meeting place of this life-saving station, it became a place of chaos. And the plush carpets got dirty, and some of the exquisite furniture got scratched. And so the property committee kind of got together, and they built a shower outside of the house where if folks were, had been shipwrecked and they were coming in to the life-saving station, they could take a shower before they got in so they didn't bring their dirt in with them, right? And, and eventually, like most of the members kind of wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because like they were unpleasant and they were a hindrance to the normal fellowship of the members, Other members insisted that the life-saving station was the primary purpose, and they pointed out that, well, they were still called a life-saving station, so that was really still important work, and, well, somehow, like, those folks were told to go somewhere else and start their own thing, and you know what? They did, and sure enough, after several years had happened, that station turned into the exact same thing that the previous station had turned into, and the way that the rumors tell it to this day is there's still a ton of shipwrecks that are out to sea, and there are a whole bunch of beautiful buildings on the seacoast but there are not many folks that are willing to get in the water and get on a boat and go out and bring those who have been shipwrecked to the safety and to the shore and to a place where they can actually heal. I just want to share with you that I know to my core and have absolutely no question in my spirit about whether Long's Chapel is a life-saving station or not. It is the best of what it means to be a life-saving station where we're longing to send those of us who have been shipwrecked and sometimes continue to be shipwrecked to be able to load up boats, go out, and be able to reach those who find themselves in crisis and, um, and to bring them home. No question in my spirit that that's, um, that's the very heart of, of of the church that is this community of faith. And I just simply want to ask you a question is, do do you you know that? Because I want to invite you to know that. I want to invite you to live that. And I want to invite you, friends, it's a really cool thing to watch healing happen. I mean, some folks don't even get to do that. But I don't want you to settle for that. I want to invite you to participate in the healing power that God is longing to activate in and through you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can we pray together? God of glory and God of grace, we give you thanks and praise for who you are and for all the different ways that you work, all the different ways that you move. And so, God, you um, are constantly inviting us, constantly inviting us to not just witness healing, but to to participate in It's very form. And so we're grateful, oh God, because sometimes, sometimes, oh God, we're the person on the stretcher and we're paralyzed and we can't move out of our own strength and we watch like people pass us by and just look at us, but we're hurting and we're broken and we're paralyzed and, and we don't know what to do. Sometimes, oh God, Um, sometimes, oh God, we get to be the four brothers in this story who we get to actually be actively looking for people that we can help take and lay at the feet of Jesus. And we can't ourselves, oh God, be an agent of healing, but we can, by God, participate in their healing by taking them to the one who is. And we have an opportunity, oh God, um, to be able to do that to be able to do that like each and every day of our lives. And so wherever we may find ourselves, whoever we may feel like that we are in this very moment, most of all, oh God, we're grateful for a Savior. We're grateful for a Savior who declares forgiveness of sins. 
forgiveness and reconciliation of brokenness that we ourselves could not manage. But that God manages for us and with us. That's all God we come. We come in our moments of activity or our moments of paralysis. We come, oh God, in our moments of helping or our moments of compassion fatigue. We're just like we don't think we have the energy in us to help carry someone right now. And then we remember, oh God. alone so that we would never have to. So, oh God, we, um, we pray for the gift of healing that Pastor Tom was right. It's always inside of us. Pray, oh God, that you would help us to see it, that you would help us to feel it, and most of all, that you would help us to live it. Strong and precious name of Christ, we pray. close this morning out with the song we ended the first set with. I've been held by the Savior I fell far from the blood Yes, I've been down to the river I ain't the same, the prodigal return is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone So all my sins are forgiven Yes, I've been washed by the blood Sing it again, all my hope Yes, all my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone And so my sins are forgiven And I've been washed by the blood I'm no stranger in the prison I've worn shackles and chains but I've been freed and forgiven And I'm not going back I'll never be the same All my hope All oh, my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone All oh, my sins are forgiven and I've been washed by the blood There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man Break him down to his knees And God, I've been broken more than a time or two Then he picked me up and showed me what it means and so my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday is gone And so my sins are forgiven And I've been washed by the blood Let's sing it one more time, all my hope And so 
my hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday's gone. And so my sins are forgiven. And I've been washed by the blood. Yes, I've been washed by the blood. Father, thank you so much just for allowing us to worship and hear from you this morning. Father, I pray that as we leave this building that you just make us bold for you. Father, allow us to see all the many blessings that we have in our lives. Allow us to spend time with our loved ones and the people around us. Allow us to encourage them. Father, strengthen us when we are weak. We love you. Amen.